Hi, listeners. Welcome to the Grief Out Loud podcast produced by the Dougie Center for Grieving Children. I'm Jana DeCristofaro and wanted to give you just a little heads up as you listen to this episode, you'll be hearing references to our old name, which was Dear Ducky. So just so you don't get too confused, you're listening to the right podcast and we look forward to bringing you even more great content under the Grief Out Loud name. Thanks for joining us. Hey listeners, welcome to the Dear Dougie podcast. Today we are hosting another episode of our guest podcast, which is called Who Died? And it's written and produced by Amy Craig. And I hope you really enjoy today's interview. And just another heads up that we're getting really close to changing our name and our artwork. We'll be moving from Dear Dougie to Grief Out Loud. And that should be happening hopefully by the end of this month, beginning of February. We'll have all the same great content, just with a new name. So thanks again for listening. This is the Who Died Podcast, and I am Amy Craig. Each episode, we hear about someone's life and death from their loved one. This episode, I spoke with Lita Husick about her mother, Selma. As you'll hear, Lita had and has a unique relationship with her mother. Why don't you start by telling me your mom's name, birthday, and death theme? Selma Kushner Husick. Born January 1st, 1918. Died September 8th, 1963. She was very uh, interested in literature and got offered a full scholarship to University of Pennsylvania, but her father didn't let her take it because he wanted her to work in the candy store that they had. Um, And that always really hurt her and... She wanted to be, she did, we used to have these beautiful photos of her on the stage. Like she did theater, she sang, she danced. Um, she was very lovely. I have these wonderful letters that he wrote her um, when he was traveling for the Red Cross. And they're on this beautiful stationery. And they're really funny and they're really interesting. They're really good artifacts. There's like 200 of them. Mm-hmm. And there's only a few postcards from her that I have back. Her handwriting is really hard to read, but she seems like such a like typical lady, like fifties lady. You know, it's all about I'm, you know, she's making this dress, or you know, and, and worrying and be careful, and um, you know, he said she had a really good sense of humor and she was kind of sardonic and. You know, it's interesting. It's it's a really good lesson in like you know how different people's perceptions affect what you find out. Like my dad is, you know, he gives us this impression of uh, my mother as this brooding, dark, you know, kind of like sad person. And then when I asked my cousin many years later in my twenties, she was like, "Oh, she was so fun. We would go to the jazz clubs together because even though Dorley was thirteen, she could pass as an as an older person and." And, and then the thing I like the most is that she said, um, you could tell her anything. Well, since I was only one when she died, I don't really have any conscious memories, although I think I may remember her mouth, which is weird. But I think, you know, when an infant is held by its mother, you really do see you, the eye level is right at the mouth. And she had a particularly beautiful mouth with a lot of red lipstick. Um, she died of um, pancreatic cancer, and she she only lived six weeks after the diagnosis. And they, the doctors instructed my dad not to tell her, which is what they did back then. So he lied the whole time, and it was very stressful. And he was a writer. He, he was an English teacher, but he wrote... He's filled so many notebooks, which I have. Okay, so here's Dad. Two men had come from Danzansky's funeral home with a rolling stretcher covered with gray felt cloth, the wheels gray or black. How all the paraphernalia of death accord with the darkness of the grave. The men who came were dressed in formal clothes. When they went upstairs to take Selma from the bed, I followed and stood in the bedroom watching. If you'll step into the other room, said the number one man, which I did very quickly as if I had violated the grave and then wondered what was going on beyond the closed door. Did the men want to save me the pain of seeing Selma's body handled like a sack of earth? 
or was there some procedure followed that could not but hurt me to see? Earlier, at Mom's suggestion, I had taken Stephanie away so that she wouldn't see Selma's body carried out. I took her to Margaret's and whispered, Selma passed away this morning. Quite calm, considering the panic that had gone before, the grief, the guilt, the pleas to God to save her. My one fear was that I would see a member of the McCoy family and was set to grim, give them a cheerful greeting. But as Mark Twain said, the most of what we fear never materializes, and I saw no one and drove away with a feeling of triumph, as if we had taken what belonged to us, the body, and escaped with it. The fierce need to keep the body for ourselves and let no one see it. Now I understand better the tragedy by the ancient Greek playwright, was it Euripides, in which the girl pleads with her uncle to give her brother an honorable burial. The girl loved her uncle and her brother and was pulled in opposite directions, but as I remember the play, a great deal was made of the body itself. I didn't fully realize at the time how much the body means to those who survive, how the survivor would sacrifice his life to keep the body from indignity. And then I added a little bit, and then I make an appearance, and I had, I'm really, I was sent to my great aunts. I wasn't there. But um, then I come in. It's kind of uh, flattering to me. When I first caught sight of Lita, so small and alert and alive and healthy looking, such a symbol of life after the pain, darkness, and remorse of death, so relieved, thankful, and hopeful to see her that I began to laugh hysterically and took her in my arms and held her tight to my body and continued to laugh at the top of my lungs, at the same time conscious of silence from the others, and I realized I was laughing too loud when suddenly I began to cry, the laughter to tears involuntarily. I know that he blamed me for her death because I read, when I was still a kid, you know, him, this whole scene of him looking at me in my crib and wondering if, you know, having me was, you know, the, the thing that killed her or helped to kill her. And, um, yeah, um, but I don't think that's true. You know, pancreatic cancer is still today an incurable, fast-moving cancer. So, mm -hmm. and she was only 45, so... She had me pretty late. She was 44. But, um, you know, my first word was dead besides mama. I know I had mama because in the diaries he talks about, like, the last contact I had was her, with her. I was on the telephone. And I was just like, mama. And so I know I had that word. And that word kind of resonates within my body, as does the word. You know, it's funny. When I say the word grandma, my whole spine relaxes. So it's internal, you know. Um, but my sister used to show me a picture of her when I was like two and say, that's, that's mommy. And I'd say mommy. And she said, she's dead. And I would say debt, D-E-T. Because dad wrote about it in the diaries. That's how I know that, about that. Mm. Um, but uh, you sort of always knew. I always knew. I, I felt like the good one went away and then came back as this, because it was very little time. It was actually a bit of a scandal because um, there's something called an unveiling of the grave in Jewish where you wait a year and there's an unveiling. You don't remarry, um, but he remarried before the unveiling. The woman Lita said remarried was emotionally and physically abusive. Grim. It was grim. It was the house on the block nobody went to. Yeah, she was just a screamer and a hitter and a puncher and a kicker. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, she worked full time, so um, it was uh, it could have been worse. And my grandmother was very upset. I know this from my cousin. Wanted to take us, you know, and you know he wouldn't. And on one of the diaries, um, around the, the him writing about the death, he uh, on the top was scrawled a quote from from my Anna, my mother's mother, where she just said she was my pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the one grandparent I knew was my, my grandma. I knew her till I was eight, and I love grandma. And I, I think I have some really, uh, some really, uh, I think I really absorbed grandma into me because um, I feel her. And 
she took care of us right after Selma died. Um, but then my dad wanted to date the ladies and she didn't approve and they didn't really get along. So he kicked her out. Mm -hmm. Um, it didn't last very long. Grandma, she didn't speak English very well. Um, she's, she spoke Yiddish and she had a lot of great sayings, you know, talk to the vol. I remember her very strong accent and she would, We'd go there and she would just kneel in front of us and like hold our shoulders and just cry in our face, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what I thought about death. Um, I just thought it was, you know, a jerk <laughs> that robbed me. I knew I was robbed. I still feel that way. Um, I feel like my life was truncated by that. I feel like, you know... I knew, I did know in art school a friend whose mom, she lost when she was two, but she was much healthier than me, I felt. I mean, her dad never remarried. Um, and she didn't have that negative, you know, stuff on her. So it wasn't just the absence, it was, it was the abuse that happened afterwards. Um, so I think had, not, had it not been for the stepmother, you know, I, I might be a little more normal. You know, I remember, I'll never forget, a mom and my friend in, like, kindergarten, she picked her up from school, and they were walking away, and I just overheard her say, <laughs> you know, uh, what do you want for your snack today? You know, cheese doodles or coffee cake? And it just stabbed me. You know, it was like a stab. You know, on top of everything else, Dad was such a health nut. We never had sugar. We didn't have any fun food. We didn't have white flour. I mean, to now I really appreciate it, and I have that those same things. But back then, it was just one more like stigma of difference, other. You know, being Jewish, being motherless, being abused at home. You know, just uh, just was that feeling of being a freak. You know, I started singing as a way of solace for myself, um, mm -hmm. and uh, we probably have similar voices. I think she had a low voice. I, well, I have kind of a range, but, you know, I prefer, I like the low register, and uh, it's funny, because I came up during, like, you know, the punk rock era in D.C., and it was really fabulous and fun, but my music never sounded like that. It was always... Mm -hmm really uh harmonic and and like you know quote pretty unquote you know because i needed that soothing you know mm -hmm. what do you think she'd think about your music yeah. i think she'd like it because every song i've ever written whether it's literally about her or not is about her mm -hmm. because um just the act of singing and playing is an act of love and and from the soul and and now I mean I'm about to embark on a new project um, <clears throat> and I think through my work I'm doing you know internally I'm able to for the first time like be more literal in the lyrics about her. I never use this guitar. This is my junior high school acoustic guitar. And it's gross and it's covered in dirt. <laughs> I play an electric guitar live, but I'll do it just for you, Amy. Okay. Thank you.
I really have forged a relationship with her through photography um, and it kind of <clears throat> attests to the power of photography that I have, you know, any of my perceptions of her are based on a very few old photos and then um, we had had some super eight, not super eight, eight millimeter home movies. Mm -hmm. Um, there were no still photographs of my mother and me. I don't know why. And I got the movies. I hadn't seen them since I was kind of a kid. And I got them a few years ago. I had them digitized. I watched them once and then I couldn't watch them anymore. And then recently I w started watching them again. And um, in conjunction with my learning at the Dougie Center, I have decided that... Um, I'm going to take this next year to sort of consciously mourn her because I never was able to and I feel that her death affected me in ways that I, I don't really... Uh, well, I think it's more like physical. Um, so I now watch the, the home movies and I pause them and I take photos of the paused image and every Sunday I'm posting on Facebook and I say the date and home movie still and I choose three words that I put together as like one long word mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know it's ritual I think it's helpful um, so yeah what are some of the ones you've posted so far? Let's see. The first one was this beautiful still because they had their honeymoon in Miami and it was 1956. And she's wearing these beautiful big white beads and it just, they're so luminous and it's all blue and she's looking out at the ocean in profile. And I think I said, Mother Ocean Dusk. The only images of me with her are on the movies and mm -hmm. so I'm posting the first image of me with her I was you know probably I don't know a little tiny but it's winter and I was born in April so I must have been like eight months old or something and that's gonna be mother self Eden mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and they're all silent these movies. they're all silent yeah and they go from around 56 or 50 yeah 56 and their honeymoon that's the beginning mm -hmm. and then and then when I'm like an infant and then they abruptly you know stop and then the next ones are in the 70s and the horrible hideous 70s mm -hmm. my sister used the camera to take movies of her long hair friends and uh <laughs> Then there's some of, of us playing tennis with dad, and mm. that's very painful because the before and after of dad, you know, when he's with my mom and us, you know, before and uh, mm -hmm. afterwards in the 70s, he's just very different, you know. What do you notice is different about him? Oh, I remember it. He, mm. he just always had this little sad smile, and he always looked down. Mm. Another really interesting thing about photography is that, you know, I had all these photographs of her, just kind of, you know, boring shots and stuff. And I'm a huge animal person. I've been a vegan for like 30 years and love animals. Um, and I I didn't know anything about my mother and animals. And then when I, one time in the 90s, early 90s, I, I traveled to Atlantic City to see my cousin and she brought all these um, photos I'd never seen. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it was amazing. Um, 
And one photograph is my mother kneeling next to a dog, hugging him. Hmm. And, you know, that really resonated. And in the movies, and the home movies, there's, you know, she's always very, like, put together and kind of formal. But then there's this one little scene where she's, they're in Miami, and she's, like, sitting up against this kind of little, like, store or something they'd gotten coffee and she's sipping coffee and she's sitting just like me like like tomboyish she's got like a handkerchief on and she's got these black glasses on that you know I'd never seen this image but I ha- I bought these vintage glasses that were the exact same glasses like these black ovals it's been a one way relationship I have to say it's been all me I'm waiting I'm waiting um, but and I'm hoping that you know, sometime before I croak, um, there'll be some kind of contact. I mean, I may not believe, and I don't know what I believe in terms of uh, the cosmos. I believe in science and, uh, you know, and emotion and that combination. And, um, but I do believe in us, you know, and I think things that are supernatural are really just the power of us. And I'm hoping that I can, you know, get to a, Connectedness. I mean, I do feel, um, I know that she loved me, and um, she looked very happy in the movie when she's holding me. Um, there was one movie that um, my sister didn't send me, and she probably like threw it away because she saw my name on it or something. I was also an infant. My mother was a little cagey about being on camera. She didn't always want to be on camera. She was kind of like, you could say she was saying, you know, even though there's no sound, like, you know, turn that thing off or something, and it's kind of scowling sometimes. And But there was one there, she's holding me, and the camera's panning, you know, over us and beyond us, and then you see her hand gesturing for him to bring the camera back, you know. So I thought that was a vote in my favor. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to hear more episodes of Who Died, you can go to whodiedpodcast.com or find us on iTunes or Stitcher. And if you like what you hear, leave a review. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.